All right, good morning. So, I don't know why, but what came to me when I was thinking about talking this week was, do you remember Jackie Gleason? Excellent, yes. And he would say, he would say, the Miami Beach audiences are the greatest audiences in the world, and then he would open his show with, and away we go. And, and I don't know, that's what came to me. It, it's, it has nothing to do with anything, I can tell you. So I'm, I'm not even going to stretch to try and make it um, fit with the talk in any way. Uh, but I don't know, I thought if there was a patron saint for our church, Jackie Gleason would probably be a pretty good one, don't you think? Yeah. So, you know, we teach in the science of mind that consciousness that we are is a magnetic force, that we are always attracting something into our life. Don't kid yourself and think, oh, I'm not attracting anything. Ernest Holmes teaches us that what we actually attract is what we are most like, or what is most like us, I think, is more accurate. So if we are filled with a high frequency, with a high vibration, then we attract that sort of experience and that sort of person to us. But if uh, we are of a low frequency or a low vibration, we will attract things that are more commensurate with that. Now, we are always attracting, but one of the things I notice, one of the things I, I see the way it works is that attraction can be blocked by, um, by our thinking, by our attitudes, by our defenses, uh, by our mental habit patterns. If we have a mental habit pattern, that is not ingratiating in the universe, what that does is like that throws up a wall in front of us. And so even though we're each like a magnet, attracting that which is most like us, attracting what we're speaking our word for and what we're visualizing and all of that, this wall actually prevents us from being able to attract what is rightfully ours. So here's the thing. Bottom line, loving attracts better experiences. Loving attracts better experiences. I was at the bank. So much transformation happens at the bank, I think. <coughs> it's extraordinary. So I just want to tell you about my little experience at the Wells Fargo. And I was there, and there was, there was a line, a big line. And I thought I saw up, oh, I don't know, many people ahead of me in the line, somebody I recognized from church. But I wasn't certain. And then we sort of, um, I zigged, they zagged, and went up to the teller. And went, ah, it's definitely somebody I know from church. I must go up and say hello on the way out. Well, this took an interesting turn because this customer, who happened to be from church, and we're, don't look around because I'm not going to point anybody out, um, was, I suspect, just having a bad day in general. And it wasn't going their way at the bank. Now, I will be the first to admit that banking is no longer like it was with Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah? Okay, can we all agree that those days of banking are gone, okay? Banking is different now. It's very clear. They're there to make money. We get it. Okay. Um, and so the teller was not going to do what this particular customer wanted her to do. And so the customer repeated what she wanted, only now louder with kind of a snarky tone you know, and, and she wanted the teller to remove some charges. The teller said, no, I'm not able to do that, and blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, none of this is my business, so I leaned way in to hear all of it. <laughs> and, uh, and so the customer got more irate, and the more irate the customer got, the thicker the plexiglass between the teller and the customer got. The teller was not going to budge at all. Now, you know, it's a funny thing because in that situation, you know, you think, oh, just a bank teller. Well, I'm here to tell you my mother was a bank teller for many years, and tellers have the power. They do. It's just like when you're on a plane. Whoever has the peanuts has the power, right? <laughs> the teller has the power. And, um, and the woman said, well, I will just close my account. And the teller said, and the bank will just charge you all the fees before you get the rest of your money. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was just really interesting to watch. I thought, you know, if you would sweeten up a little bit here, you would have a much better chance of having things go the way you want. But because you're not being sweet, this teller has no intention of giving you anything they want. And it's all within their realm. You know, because they can grant some things, they can take some charges away, they can call the manager for some help. 
And this tittle, teller was not going to budge. Just not going to budge. It was so interesting to watch. Now, I say this because I think I have been that customer in line. Now, not recently, I think. I'm grateful. Thank you, God. But I'm sure at some point along the way, I have been that irate customer who was in... And you know, you don't get what you want. You don't get what you want. So my point again is that loving attracts better experiences. You know, and I wonder why sometimes we are unavailable for the better experience when I think, well, I should just be able to be snarky at the bank and get what I want. No, that is not the way it works. That is not the way it works at the bank, and it seems to me that that is not the way it works in life. Why, why would we not make ourselves available for the expression of something greater that's always here, that's, that's always right in front of us? I think we want, we want, we say, we want our life to be good, we want things to be better, yet we can sabotage and push it away so easily, just like that. We, we are the ones who can just say, mm, not now, universe, not now, spirit. I can wait because I want to be such a farm animal today that I will not um, allow myself to be available because you know, and may, maybe I just don't feel safe or maybe I'm just in a funky mood. But if we feel not safe, I think that, again, is one of those times when we have a tendency to put walls up to protect ourselves. Now, those walls are, again, the barrier to the greater good that we could bring into our life. You know, I don't, I don't know a lot about the woman at the bank personally, but I was in my car and I was doing my figuring after and putting my paperwork away and I was thinking, you know, what if she is somebody who is looking for a relationship? There were men in line. Somebody might have thought, hmm, she's cute. I'm going to hang around and say hello to her after. But after the way that interaction went down, they probably said, hmm, maybe not. I think not. You know? and, and who knows what else? There might have been somebody there who was a casting director and could have hired her for something. They thought, hmm, nope, she's going to be trouble on the set. I've seen her before. I thought she was talented, but nope, that personality is going to be trouble on the set. We're not going to hire her. And on and on and on. You know, because the universe has millions and millions of eyes. You know, God, spirits, the universe, however we articulate it, sees absolutely everything we do and the energy with which we do it. You know, because we all understand that you can be really sweet, you know, and talk in a really sweet tone of voice, and you can be a real terror on the inside. Do you know what I mean? Yes, we all know that. We know that. We see that in Los Angeles a lot. We do, where people will just sort of be sweet to your face, but you know it's just, um, it's just a little gloss on, on top of the situation. Um, our world, I believe, needs love and kindness, just like each and every one of us needs fresh air and sunshine and water. You know, I run into people and I find that they think if they are too happy, they'll be complacent in life. Now, that's always funny to me. It's like, do you not know that God is actually smarter than you? you no, know? no, really, really. You know, because, because not being happy actually creates more happiness. You know, no, no joy, you know, saying, well, I can't be really joyful now. That, that, that creates more no joy. No love creates more no love. We know people for whom nothing is ever enough. Don't be that person. Really, 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 don't be that person for whom nothing is ever enough. How often do we look back and say, wow, I should have appreciated that day. I didn't know that was going to be the wonderful day that it turned out to be, or I should have appreciated that experience. I should have appreciated those people more. See, the personality doesn't want to be satisfied ever. The personality knows, you know, I'm here for better things, but if I really enjoy this, won't I be, um, like I said, complacent and never experience anything better? Well, first of all, God is infinite. And we each have an infinite capacity to open up, to expand, to receive, to experience more. You know, because when we can enjoy what is, I think that is exactly how the universe opens up to us. You know, how the universe is able to give us more and more and more. The universe doesn't open up to us, I think, when we are in um, kind of a hateful mode. I hate this person, I hate this situation, I hate this. That actually closes us off. You hear that? Hating closes us off. 
So, so, so what's the idea? Well, the idea is to you know, love what you do, love where you are, bless what you have, and the universe gives you more. So I want to tell you um, just a little piece of a story. I had the opportunity to be involved in facilitating uh, a healing reconciliation um, with a woman uh, and her son, her grown son. Uh, I can tell you that the, the woman was 80 years old. And 32 years ago, a group of teenagers murdered her teenage daughter. And she has wrestled with this for 32 years. And it recently occurred to her that she needed to forgive. And this was huge. This was unbelievable. And so um, now one of the people involved uh, had served their time in jail and was now out. And so um, we met right here. We met right here. And, um, and it, was, it was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary experience. So I asked the, the, the mother, why, why do you want to meet her? And she said, I have to forgive. You know, basically, I'm paraphrasing. She says, I'm old now. What time I have left, I would like to find some peace. And she says, and she's still young, the age of my daughter. I would like for her to find peace and some happiness for the rest of her life. She's paid the price. I want to forgive. And so we spent a couple hours together, going back and forth and back and forth. And it was an amazing, amazing experience uh, to be a part of because, you know, all of the personality stuff comes up, and the personality stuff says, don't forgive, and you're crazy. You know, just go over there and punch her, and all the, you know, I mean, all the stuff that, that crazy stuff that runs through, through your head. But here is this woman who has lived most of her life, and, and it did not go unnoticed by her that she has had significant heart problems for a while. And she was hopeful that if she made a step in the right direction, if she made some progress and was actually able to really forgive this woman, that it might ease some of the tension and problems around her own heart. Well, I'll let you know how that goes. I'll let you know how that, how that goes. Um, but you know, I was, I was thinking about it after, and I thought, this woman's willingness to forgive and it took her a while to get there. And we talked about how forgiveness is a process. It's not a one-shot thing. It's not like you say one time, OK, I forgive you, tra-la, tra-la, we never think about it again. It's a process, especially for something big, especially for something hard, especially for something really personal, like her teenage daughter, her only daughter, who she just loved and adored. You know, when I, um, when I teach the Abundance Workshop, I always tell people, you need to use the best you have, whatever you have that's good. Use it. Do not save it. Because if you save what's good in your life, you're telling the universe you don't need more good. Because you're not somebody who is in the process of circulating and using your good. You've got plenty of good tucked away at the back of the drawer. Right? So whatever good you have, you're worth the best there is. Science of mind teaches us. At least that's my interpretation. So if Ernest didn't say it, I'm saying it. You are worth the best there is. And use the best you have. Now, I thought in this situation, this 80-year-old woman was absolutely using the best she had. She got to a place where she sifted through all of the anger and all of the hurt and all of the loss and was able to come up with, I need to forgive. I think that was the best within her. I think that was absolutely, that was the gem. That was the gem. In fact, before our time was over, she said, to the woman who had been involved in murdering her daughter, she said, honey, it's OK. Come to my house. We'll have coffee. We'll sit. We'll talk. I thought that was just unbelievable that she was willing to say to this girl, honey, you've paid the price. Now, just, it's OK. It's OK. I think 
we have an infinite capacity, each of us does today, an infinite capacity to love, to give, to receive, to appreciate. And, and we don't, uh, nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. I mean, think of all the people who make life better for you. Just do that now. Think about it. Just think of the people, the faces that flash through your mind, all the people who make life better for you. Whether it's somebody in your family or your next door neighbor or somebody you work with or somebody here at church or your dry cleaner or the teller at the bank. Think of all the people who make your life better for you. You know, we, we talk a lot about this notion of counting your blessings and what you're grateful for increases, that gratitude is the anointing of increase. But you know, so often, though, we'll say, God, I want a bigger life. But the universe says, how are you doing with the life you have right now? Are you loving the people who are in your life right now? Are you appreciating what's in your life right now? Are you grateful for your current state of health and wealth and on and on and on? Are you using the good stuff? Are you taking in um, this moment of the day wherever we are in life. Because if, if, you think, if you think less than, if you think of yourself as less than, if you think of other people as less than, if you say, this is all too much for me, I can't handle it, then that's what the universe has to mirror back to you. Mm -hmm. Not because you are, but because that's what you're putting out there into the universal mind. So I think we show up with all of our reasons not to so often, you know, Oh, uh, they're not this the way I need them to be, or um, this situation is not the way I want, or maybe, maybe tomorrow I'll feel better and be in, maybe tomorrow I'll have some inspiration about this. Um, you know, and the bigger, more creative, abundant life you lead, it seems to me that there will be more to challenge you, more distractions, more difficulties. You know, like if you own a home, there's always a level of maintenance in a home, isn't there? There just is. It's not like you're doing anything wrong, but at some point, the paint peels, right? So you didn't do anything wrong, you didn't do anything to cause it, you know? But there's just always a level of maintenance. That doesn't mean don't own a home, you know? But with a bigger life, obviously comes more responsibility, you know? And you have to know, you have to tell yourself, you know, I can do it, I'm up for it. I can certainly handle this. You know, this is my consciousness. If we say, this is not good enough, the universe responds, because it's done unto us as we believe, right? So if nothing is ever good enough, if that's what we put out there, we will find that what shows up in our life, the people and the circumstances, are just not, they just don't measure up for us. So I'd say ask you to look at your life, and particularly look at those areas where it's working well. And we all have areas that are working well. In those areas, you're believing something. You're doing something. You're probably uh, including that area in your spiritual practice or your thought. So great. If you can do it in one area, you can certainly do it in another. And I believe things work better when I'm, well, when I'm not so attached, which is interesting in science of mind, because people always say to me, well, I don't know. Do I be specific or do I let go and let God? And the answer is yes, both. They go, oh my God, how do I do that? How can I be specific and let go and let God? And it's like, well, I think it's, it's okay to be specific. It's okay to know the direction you're going in, but also know that sometimes God has a bigger, better idea, and you need to be open to that, right? Because it's not my business, it's actually God's business. You know, that, that each of us, I think we aspire to just be the vessel for that higher power to work through us, whether we're doing an acting role or we're writing a book or we're coming to church or whatever it is we do. So I think, you know, to release and let go, this is like saying, God, this or something better. I always go back to that quote from Ernest Holmes in the textbook where he says, when we learn to trust the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well. And think, oh, trust the universe. I don't know about trusting the universe. Can I really trust the universe? And it's like, well, you either think God is for you, life is for you, or you think God is against you, life is against you. Now, science of mind, we believe that God is absolutely for us, that God only knows to give of God's self to each and every one of us. I think the universe is set up to support us in living a happy, abundant life. Um, but again, I think we are the ones who close the floodgate. We limit the flow. Um, 
I want to say to people sometimes, and I have to say it to myself, just be nice. Can't you just be nice? Don't you remember your mother saying that to you? Just be nice. They say, well, why? Because, and, the, and the answer now is because you're not going to get what you want the way you're being. You know, that's, that creates the wall. That creates the barrier. But if you're nice, the universe relaxes a little bit. Because the principle to me seems, the way the principle seems to operate to me is that lo when love flows, good things happen. You know? When love flows from us, good things happen. And when it doesn't, yeah, not so much, huh? Not so much. So I don't know if you're going to go to the bank this week. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do, I hope that you will dig to that deep place and bring up some of the best that is within you. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward right now for a moment to recognize that we are surrounded and filled with God's spirit, God's love, God's light, God that is the very truth of our being, God that's everywhere present, including in our own heart right now. And so in this awareness of our connection with God, with spirit, with love, I know we're also all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. In the mind and heart of God, we are one. And so I speak this word for us today, knowing that yes, and away we go, we move forward into our life having released any complaint in the universe. We move forward in our life having let go of what does not serve us. We move forward bringing forward the very best that is within us. Because we've tried it other ways and that just has not worked so well. So I know each of us has the capacity to dig deep into our divine nature and call forth that very best. And so we bring that to our relationships, to our work, to our home life, to everything that we do. And we include in our prayer today our family members and our friends and loved ones. And we say God is right where they are, surrounding them, filling them, uplifting them. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in, touching all people, all situations, no one excluded, because within our own heart and mind, we have a God that's big enough to include all. We bless our church. We bless churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths. We bless them. Because again, on that unseen side of life, we're all connected. In fact, we are all one. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.